committee will come to order. This hearing is fully virtual, so we need to address a few of the housekeeping matters. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. The chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition. If I notice when you are recognized that you have not unmuted yourself, I will ask if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will unmute your microphone. We will begin with the chair and ranking member, then members present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized in order of seniority. We are using the five minute clock, which you will notice on your screen. It will show how much time is remaining. If there is a uh, technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. In regard to adding extraneous or additional material to the record, per house rules, we have set up an email address where members can send anything they wish to submit for the record after seeking recognition for its inclusion. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. I would like to welcome the Comptroller General uh, of the Government Accountability Office, Mr. Gene Dodaro to present the GAO's fiscal year 2023 budget request. Mr. Dodaro, we welcome you back to our subcommittee. The subcommittee has great admiration for you personally and GAO's work in ferreting out misconduct and finding ways to save billions of dollars with public fact-based nonpartisan recommendations to improve federal agency operations and save taxpayers billions of dollars. The GAO has been a tremendous resource to Congress, especially this past year, in researching and providing recommendations after the attack on January 6th. The GAO has worked hard to respond to inquiries, conduct oversight, and provide valuable recommendations to the United States Capitol Police, Architect of the Capitol, and others in response to the attacks. GAO published numerous flash reports providing invaluable insight toward reform and security upgrades. We wanna thank you and your team for GAO's recommendations and technical assistance to the committee on ways that the Congress can strengthen and reassert its power of the purse over appropriations. The GAO's proposals to reinforce Congress's constitutional power of the purse, GAO recommended requiring the Office of Management and Budget to publicly post all apportionments of executive branch appropriations as a way to improve congressional oversight and facilitate GAO providing more timely advice and legal decisions to Congress. We strongly believe in these goals and we are pleased to report that the fiscal year 2022 Consolidated Appropriations Act enacted a new requirement for OMB to make apportionments of appropriations publicly available consistent with GAO's recommendation. We look forward to OMB's timely implementation of this provision. This year, GAO is requesting an increase of $91 million in appropriated funds over what was provided in fiscal year 2022, as well as 3,500 full-time equivalents or FTEs in fiscal year 2023. Included in this increase is 25 million in no year funds to meet the congressional directives and report requests of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. We look forward to hearing your testimony today and justification for these significant increases. At this point, I'd like to yield to my colleague and friend, Ms. Herrera Butler, our ranking member for any opening statements that she would like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Dodaro, sorry. I've only had like four cups of coffee today already. Um, welcome back. It is very good to see you. Uh, the Government Accountability Office supports Congress in meeting our constitutional responsibility uh, by ensuring that the money that we appropriate uh, is spent for the purpose it was prescribed. And interestingly, we've seen challenges to that in the last number, at least since my time in Congress. So your work is, is, is doubly important. And I honestly, this benefits American people by improving the performance of their funds um, and, and, and the accountability to the federal government. Uh, with products such as 1,602 new recommendations, 
Uh, 578 reports and over 60 congressional testimonies last year alone. Your agency is meeting its strategic objective in providing quality, timely service to Congress. And another uh, important tool GAO is constructing is a framework for managing improper payments. Um, and most uh, individuals or families or businesses who hear that would probably be like, wait, what? That's not already in place? Well, um, thank you to GAO, we are moving in that direction. And for fiscal 2021, uh, the Office of Management and Budget reported that the federal agencies had estimated about $281 billion in improper payments. The economic instability and increased flow of federal funds associated with COVID-19, and there's a significant increased uh, flow of funds uh, at a very, in a, a very clipped pace, have greatly increased the opportunities for fraud, uh, making that, that framework for managing improper payments really essential to our nation's financial management. It's also really great to see a wide range of work being done by the new Science Technology Assessment and Analytics Unit uh, from the framework for oversight of artificial intelligence, questions for policymakers to consider regarding long COVID, um, and identifying opportunities and challenges to counter uh, drone technology. So this unit will provide Congress valuable insights into emerging technologies and policy recommendations to harness the benefits and mitigate some of the risks with those emerging technologies. Your fiscal 23 budget request continues to build staff capacity and audit resources, modernize IT systems and address, address building infrastructure deficiencies. I look forward to hearing how these resources will further improve GAO's work. And with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Herrera Butler. I don't believe that uh, Ms. Deloro is here uh, or Ms. Granger. So uh, without objection, your written testimony uh, will be made part of the record. Mr. Dodaro, please summarize your statement for the members of the committee. Once you have finished your statement, we will move to the question and answer period. So the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Herrera Butler, members of the committee. I'm very pleased to be here today to talk about GAO's work and our budget request. Uh, first, I wanna thank the committee very much for the support that you've given us over the past few years. And I believe we've returned a great investment on that uh, that uh, support that you've given us. Over the last five years, we've returned $158 for every dollar invested in GAO and financial benefits to the government. There have been over 100 and uh, or 1,200 uh, other benefits in terms of improvements in public safety, greater efficiency and effectiveness of agency operations as a result of implementation of our recommendations as well. Now, in addition to our normal work, which supports about 90% of the standing committees of the Congress, we've been given a few special assignments here. Uh, first was to track and report on a real-time basis over $4.5 trillion spent for the coronavirus relief assistance. We've issued nine government-wide reports talking about the status of that work. We've issued uh, over 135 individual reports. We've made 200 and 77 recommendations to for mid-course corrections, both in the public health area, as well as increasing transparency and accountability over the funds. Just last month, I testified before the Senate outlining 10 specific legislative uh, improvements that I think Congress could make to deal with a pervasive and growing improper payments problem and the lack of prevention of fraud in the first place. In addition, we updated our high risk list for the Congress, which we do at the beginning of each new Congress uh, last year. And two areas I wanna highlight, because it's very important to the well-being of the American people that we added to the list. One is a need for greater federal leadership and a national strategy to deal with drug misuse. This is particularly important in light of the growing number of overdose overdose deaths, which have reached historic levels. And we outlined a number of ways that that could be done. We also highlighted and added HHS's leadership and coordination for public health emergencies. 
uh, not just uh, you know, infectious diseases, but natural disasters and other areas. Uh, there's a need for more clarity in roles and responsibilities, more better and consistent communication with the public, uh, and better transparency and oversight over that work. Also, uh, we our work on identifying overlap, duplication, and fragmentation in the federal government has now resulted in over 1,200 recommendations, half of which have been implemented by the Congress. And so far, that has saved uh, $5.5 billion uh, to the federal government as a result of implementation of our recommendations in that area. Now, we're seeking funds. Uh, for five areas. One is to increase our work in the science and technology area. We've greatly increased the number of technology assessments. Uh, the uh, ranking member, Herrera Butler, mentioned the work we're doing in artificial intelligence. We've also done blockchain, 5G, and a number of other areas that I could talk about in the Q&A. Uh, also, we're getting more requests, not only from committees, but individual member offices. So I wanna increase the number of staff we have in that area to not only provide more technology assessments, and, and, uh, but also to provide more technical assistance to the members throughout the Congress. A second area of cybersecurity is an area I've long been concerned about. I designated a high risk area across the government in 1997. Uh, we added critical infrastructure protection in 2003. We beefed up that area. The federal government, in my opinion, is still not acting at a pace commensurate with the evolving grave threat to our national security in that, in that area. So I'd like to beef up, again, our cybersecurity work. We're getting inundated with requests uh, from the Congress, particularly now that the concern has been growing, which it should have been, in the critical infrastructure protection area and other areas like defense weapon systems. So not, this is not just information systems, it's the functioning of all the federal government's uh, operations. Third area is national defense. Obviously the situation in Ukraine and other uh, uh, developments around the world means that the, you know, we'll get, be getting an increased uh, requests from the Congress. There's also, you know, a lot of concern about competition from Russia and China. Uh, we're doing a lot of work in hypersonic weapons, artificial intelligence, military readiness. And I think with additional investments in defense, uh, the number of requests that we'll receive will, will continue to, to increase in that area. Fourth is healthcare. Healthcare is the fastest growing portion of the federal government's budget. Half of the improper payments that Ms. Herrera Butler mentioned or in Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid alone had over $98 billion in improper payments last year, and Medicare over $45 billion. And those are not complete estimates, in my judgment. Uh, the managed care portion of Medicaid is not being uh, really evaluated for improper payments. That's about half of the Medicaid program. So this problem is a lot bigger. Uh, but also, you know, we've been doing a lot more work in behavioral health issues, mental health issues that have been uh, a problem, a growing problem. They were exacerbated during the uh, pandemic. And then the fifth area, as the chairman mentioned, is infrastructure investments. The Congress has made a huge investment in that area. The Infrastructure Act gave us 35 individual mandates uh, for us to... Uh, do specific studies. The Consolidated Appropriation Act, which just passed, add seven more mandates to that. Our discussions with the committees indicate that uh, we'll be getting a lot more requests even over and above those mandates. So we could use a little extra help in that area. And of course, our budget uh, submissions also to help us improve our infrastructure operations and the uh, environment and the GAO and also in information technology to improve our own computer security uh, and to uh, continue to make our operations more efficient and effective and getting more digital products to the Congress uh, in a faster pace. Lastly, I would just close by uh, you know, publicly thanking the dedicated and talented people that we have at the GAO. We have one of the best workforces for audit organizations in the world. 
Uh, and I'm very pleased. We were also rated number one in best places to work this past year by the public service, uh, uh, private sector public service uh, for among mid-sized agencies in the federal government. So I'm very proud of our record at GAO. I'm happy to respond to questions today and I appreciate the opportunity. I know that you'll take our requests carefully uh, under deliberation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Always uh, great to hear from you. This is uh, one of my favorite hearings every year to, to hear about how you're trying to help us modernize the government. A um, couple questions. I'll, I'll start off here first, Mr. Dodaro. Um, do you know how many member requests were uh, you guys were unable to respond to in the past year or so? Yeah, well, we, we are able to get to all the requests, but not as quickly as we would like, Mr. Chairman. I mean, that's that's part of the problem. Uh, there are about 67 that we weren't able to get to when we promised the committee that we would we would be able to get to them because of developments that happened. Like, for example, we had reached agreement with everybody about all the requests before the omnibus uh, passed, and then there's you know 25, 30 more statutory mandates in there. We, according to the congressional protocols that we negotiated with the Congress, priority one are requests for statutory mandates uh, and committee and conference report mandates. Priority two are requests from committee chairs and ranking members, and uh, so you know we do that. So about 10 percent of the of the work that we did, we couldn't get to exactly when we said we were gonna get there. I'm hopeful if our budget request is, is honored, we'll be able to uh, do better on, on that next year. Can you give us a little more specifics on, uh, on doing better? So what does that mean? Like what's the average turnaround time now for a member request and what would it be if this budget request was fulfilled and you got 3,500 full-time equivalents? Yeah, well, typically we're you know fully booked all the time. So when we get a request in, uh, if it's not a priority one, priority ones we try to start right away. Uh, it's about four months before we can get to uh, a number of member requests. And so what I'd like to do if we get this request is at least get it down lower to four months. I'm not sure how much. A lot depends on how much what the volume of requests are during the year and the increase in the number of statutory requirements that Congress has given us. The, the, it, there's been a huge increase in the statutory mandates that Congress has given us, you know, including the coronavirus area. There we had to provide monthly briefings uh, to the uh, set of committees, as well as bi-monthly reports on you know, what was the equivalent of doubling the size of federal expenditures during the year. So it's a very dynamic situation. We're always working with the committees to set priorities. That's the, the best way to deal with this. I regularly meet with chairs and ranking members of the committees to try to you know, make sure that we're working on their greatest priorities and what their needs are. And of course, their needs always evolve and change as well. So it's about four months, uh, but let me want, ask, want, to do, want to do better. Let me ask you a couple qu uh, quick questions here. Um, we're all hearing about having trouble recruiting and getting uh, people on board. How, how is the, the wage structure there? Is it competitive? Or are you having trouble finding people uh, to, to come and work for GAO? Uh, no, we're not having any difficulty. I mean, I, I, the, you know, the wage issues are always important uh, to focus on. You know, we've asked for cost of living increases and given performance increases. Since March 20, when the pandemic started, we've hired over a thousand people. You know, 400 and some were interns, which is the pipeline for our continued improvement. We've hired 556, um, you know, uh, 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 permanent employees. Uh, you know, I'm very pleased. You know, we've, <clears throat> you know, more than doubled the staff in the science, technology, and assessments area. When we started in, um, 2019, we had 49 people in that area. Now we've got 127. We're on target to get try to get to 149 by the end of the year. I'd like to increase it another 20 or so next year. Uh, same in cybersecurity. So we're we're not having a problem, and our retention rate is really good, Mr. Chairman. We we've retained 
at least 94% of our people since 2017 or better every year. So our attrition rate's 6% or, or so, and half of that's retirements. You know, the, I'll, be, I'll be the last, last baby boomer left in GAO. But, uh, <laughs> you know. Great. Uh, real quick, um, we know you, you make these great recommendations and we value them. Um, what actions have you guys taken uh, as far as encouraging agencies to act and, and what can we do from the congressional side uh, to encourage people to implement what your recommendations are? Yeah, I appreciate that question. About 76% on average of our recommendations get implemented during a four-year period of time, which is, you know, some of them are complicated and takes time to, to act. What I do uh, this year, I, meet, I met with every new leader of the federal departments and agencies across the government to talk to them, get to know them. I, I do that on a regular basis when there's a new administration or there's a change in the leadership position because of turnover. I sent, send letters to every head of departments and agencies across the government listing open priority GAO recommendations. Yeah, I don't list everything, but I, I prioritize it for their personal attention. Uh, those letters are sent to the congressional committees they're also made public. So there's you know, a lot of visibility over those issues. We also work with the committees uh, to make sure that the committees uh, take action. Like in the omnibus, there were you know, 20 some provisions directing people to implement GAO recommendations. So that's, that's what we do. Now, what the Congress could do is to continue to you know, hold oversight hearings, work with us to implement these areas Right now, we have about 5,000 open GAO recommendations, which we keep accumulating. You know, Ms. Herrera Butler mentioned, you know, 1,600 new recommendations last year. So we're always adding new recommendations. About 446 are priority recommendations. These are things that could have significant savings uh, and things that would be important for public safety and security reasons. Right. Great, Ms. Herrera Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I had a similar question along the first, what, what uh, Chairman just asked. So I'm gonna skip down a little bit. Um, so Comptroller, given the nation's long-term fiscal challenges, um, I don't think, I don't think anybody here would think, agree that, uh, or would agree that we should not be wasting 281 billion on improper payments. In fact, the 281 billion, I understand is a conservative estimate um, considering several agencies with large programs are not reporting estimates, uh, and some estimates are not comprehensive. So Congress needs, I think, GAO's guidance to address this problem. Um, so what's GA doing to address this area of significant waste in the federal budget, and do you have any recommendations to our committee for legislative or technical changes to prevent these improper payments? Uh, yes. Uh, I, uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I testified about 10 different legislative solutions to these areas. Number one, we need to get the chief financial officers of all departments and agencies involved in reviewing the estimates. Right now, it's only the program people who administer the programs that provide the estimates. We need to get more rigor in the estimates, but also to follow up on corrective action plans. Uh, and to bring the rate down. I mean, the rate's been brought down through concerted effort in the Medicare program, but not in Medicaid. Uh, this is a pervasive problem. Uh, there were 86 programs that reported last year in proper payments at 16 different agencies across the government. A third of those had error rates above 10%, some approaching 20% uh, error rates. So this is a real problem. So we get the CFOs more involved. Uh, there needs to be more public reporting. OMB uh, <clears throat> retrenched on the uh, provision to have it reported and each agency produces a financial report every year. And OMB said that you didn't have to report improper payments in the financial report of the agency. I said, that doesn't make sense. I mean, that the, the financial report is basically to say how they provided stewardship over federal funds and whether the payments were proper or not. So I 
uh, I've been encouraging OMB to reinstate the requirement, but Congress should put it in the law. Secondly, I think every, or thirdly rather, every new, new federal program that's over $100 million should be determined to be susceptible to improper payments. So they make estimates in the first year of the program. They have to prove that it's not a problem given the pervasive nature of this, rather than the current situation, which is they're not required to make estimates until two, until two or three years into the program when these problems are entrenched. So it's too late before we get on top of the problem. I've also made a number of recommendations to improve fraud, but I, I know you have other questions. So uh, we can talk about those potentially later. I'd be happy to submit my testimony to the committee with all our legislative recommendations. Uh, that'd be great. I feel like every we could spend a long time just talking about the Medicaid piece alone, dedicate a whole hearing to. Um, I wanted to ask about, I'm trying to decide what to do, uh, which one to do. Uh, honestly, let's see, we'll, we'll, I'm going to stay on the science, strengthening the science, technology, and assessment analytics team. The committee is really pleased with the work and the growth um, of this, of the, I think the STAA, um, STAA, okay, I don't know how to say it right, but we're excited <laughs> about this. Um, and I think your candid assessment about whether SDA would, would benefit from greater independence within GAO to, to, to have better autonomy to pursue kind of self-directed work that could benefit Congress. Um, do you think that it has enough staff, resources, and bandwidth to do this? And, and, um, and then should it have its own appropriations line? And if not, how do we ensure that division uh, gets the resources needed? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, SDAA, like a lot of all the teams in GAO, have tremendous independence uh, to, to do the work. Uh, and we work in cooperation. And, and also, all the work we do in GAO basically has people from multiple teams staffing that work. So, for example, when we do a technology assessment on regenerative medicine, which we're going to do, our healthcare professionals and our healthcare team work on that, too. You know, you, you, you need people who have both technical and policy backgrounds on that area. I am not in favor, and I testified on this before the House Committee on Modernization, I'm not in favor of separate line item appropriations uh, for SDAA or any other team in GAO because I think it will lead to uh, stovepipes within the agencies. I've spent most of my career eliminating stovepipes within GAO and in federal agencies across the federal government. And you know, I mentioned other areas in my statement that are of intense interest to the Congress, including defense and healthcare. So I think it would be disastrous and ruin our flexibility if there was a specific appropriation for defense, healthcare, SDAA. I mean, we're being responsive. We've increased the size of the group, um, asking for some additional resources, We've never, never not met any request from Congress in the SDAA area. So there's no, my issue, th th this is a solution in search of a problem. And, and I think it would be th th you know, very detrimental to GAO to go in that direction. Message received. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Herrera Butler. Uh, next is Ms. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. It is good to be with you, Comptroller Dodaro. I wanna begin by thanking you and your team for two GAO reports I requested, one on preventing child abuse in youth residential facilities, and another that evaluated the employer provided childcare credit. They took over a year to get here, but they were incredible when I got them. So I am delighted to hear that this budget is looking to reduce the four month wait. You've been able to narrow this down to further, but do you have any sense of time frame, or is just this budget will help you keep moving in the right direction? Well, it'll keep, help us keep moving in the right direction. I hesitate to give a time frame because I don't know what the volume of requests are yeah. going to be. 
you know, we're, we're unlike a consulting firm has to go out and look for business, you know, to, 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 <laughs> we, we, business comes to us and it comes in droves and it comes from a lot of uh, different sources. So I, I hesitate to give you a specific uh, provision, but this will give us a hundred more people. And I'm <laughs> confident that that will help us to be more timely in being responsive to the, to the Congress. That, that is good news. And uh, I also want to thank you uh, for your focus. Uh, it is a priority for Congress and the Biden administration on cybersecurity. And I know that is one for your information technology and cybersecurity team, ITC. Um, I wonder if you can share with us what your assessment of the federal government's efforts in recent years to secure critical infrastructure especially in light of the threats from Russia that we are seeing, and to what extent your budget is going to improve upon ITC's expertise and capacity to remedy cybersecurity shortcomings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I mentioned in my opening statements, I don't think the federal government's operating at a pace commensurate with the evolving threat. This is particularly yeah. true in the critical infrastructure area. You know, there are standards uh, produced by the National Institute of Standards and Technology that uh, are given to the private sector. And, you know, 80% of the computing assets in our country are in the private sector hands. So this is very important and critical infrastructure protection. As I mentioned that I designated a high risk area in 2003. So I've long been concerned about this and in industrial control systems and other things as we become more dependent on technology. But those standards are voluntary to be implemented on the part of the agency. There's a very few specific areas where the federal government has regulatory authority that they can you know, be more aggressive and implement those standards. So really right now for many of these 16 critical infrastructure sections, the federal government really doesn't know how prepared the infrastructure sectors are to deal with cybersecurity threats. I was glad to see the Congress pass legislation to require more reporting of cybersecurity incidents and, and on a faster uh, basis. So that's one step in the right direction. But there needs to be more sharing of information between the public sector and the private sector. What this reminds me of is before 9-11, when there weren't sharing among the 16 different intelligence agencies mm. about terrorist threats. We had a very, you know, again, the stovepipe kind of operation and, and they're not enough sharing. And so as a result, we're not able to react enough or give them advice on how to prevent things. So uh, there's a lot more work needs to be done. I'm pleased that we're becoming more aggressive in the federal government about dealing with these issues, but it shouldn't take a colonial pipeline issue and some of these other, you know, real disaster situation, prompt action. Yeah. And, and Speaking of sharing, I agree with you, the sharing with the, across the, the private and the public, um, but sticking to the public and the public, last year we talked about um, your ability to share information and the challenges you were experiencing with respect to the intelligence community, um, and you were optimistic in your assessment of uh, IC's willingness to cooperate. And I wonder if you could update us on how your meeting with Director Haynes uh, went last year and has anything changed since your last assessment of cooperation from the IC? Yeah, I was very pleased with my meeting with Director Haynes, as I have been with most of my meetings with the, uh, the agencies and where I've had some problems you know, I've talked, uh, had further discussions with the agencies and that's been worked out, it's working there. But in, in the intelligence community, uh, uh, my optimism was, was uh, correct, all right? So I, 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 I still feel optimistic about it. There are always gonna be special challenges in that area because of the sensitivity, but I'm confident we can work through all those issues. And we've been getting additional requests uh, from the Congress to look at that. Like for example, their ability in the intelligence community to have Chinese language skills. Uh, for example, we're looking at that issue now. We've looked at personnel vetting. We've looked at hiring and, and talent management in the agencies. And so 
our work is is increasing uh, and the cooperation has been uh, you know good. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Next up is the uh, gentleman who was the first to arrive here today on the committee. Uh, yes. Mr. Newhouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the recognition for the, being on time. I'd say, um, Mr. Comptroller General, thanks for being with us this morning. And thank you and uh, everyone that you work with for your, your very important efforts on a key uh, function of a federal government. <clears throat> and appreciate the, all the work that you've done and, and your, your, your reporting today. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit or ask you a little bit about the uh, First of all, um, you know, part of the COVID relief efforts, the Congress established this um, special investigator for uh, COVID-19 uh, programs. And so curious as to your, uh, you talked a little bit about it in your opening remarks, but you want to be clear about your coordination, your, the, the relationship uh, with that office, um, the intersection uh, that uh, that you've you know, kind of delineated the responsibilities. Um, so that's that's one uh, idea I want to uh, be more clear on. Then also um, the num the numbers you know, are you know, out of something over four and a half trillion dollars of aid that's been put out there. You know the, the numbers of fraud still are pretty staggering, uh, large numbers. Mm -hmm. and, and I wanted to know if. If the numbers that are being reported are, are specific, clear uh, numbers of fraud, or are they estimates? Or if they are specific, does that mean that these are active cases that we're going after uh, the recovery of these funds? Uh, and I've heard that overall the number of something over $230 billion in fraud with only about, and you correct me if I'm wrong, only about 10 billion of that overall been recovered. Um, and if that's the case, you can verify, but what's the, what's the prospects of recovering more than uh, that amount and uh, what, what will it take to, to get there? Is, it, or is this kind of like squeezing blood out of a turnip, so to speak? Um, or is there a good chances of, of, is there a good chances of us recovering more? Um, so just want to start with those thoughts if you could. Sure. Uh, first, on the, uh, the special pandemic uh, uh, relief accountability committee that was established in the inspector general office, right after the CARES Act was passed in 2020, uh, that was one of my first calls was to Michael Horowitz, who became the, the chair of that committee to work on cooperative agreements. You know, I meet just this uh, past month, we meet every March with the IG community, all 78 or so IGs to coordinate, we coordinate with each one. So we have very effective working relationships with the inspector general community to make sure we're each using our resources effectively and efficiently. And we coordinate on a, on a, regular, on a regular basis. Now, with regard uh, to the fraud situation, uh, the uh, efforts, there was great sense of urgency to get this money out. And as a result, some of the controls that should have been in place before the payments were made were either reduced or eliminated. Yeah. And then also, you know, a number of corrective actions that, that I had recommended in our agency uh, to put in, if you do that, you got to quickly do post-payment reviews to make sure you did it right. You know, the money's out there, but then you check, you monitor, and then you audit, and those were slow to come. Now, now, now part of this problem, Congressman Newhouse, was exacerbated by the fact that agencies did not implement legislation the Congress passed in 2016. In 2016, GAO had identified a fraud uh, framework that could be used to prevent fraud. Now, you, the only way to successfully safeguard the federal government's money is to prevent it in the first place. You have very dim prospects of, of uh, recovering the money after it's long gone. And in your analogy, I bet more on the turnip than I would on the, uh, getting the money back in, the, in these cases. 
And uh, so, but the agencies were slow to implement this. So this was particularly true at SBA and the, the Labor Department, the Unemployment Insurance Program. So I was very disappointed. Uh, and uh, this caused a problem. Now, with regard to the estimates, they're all estimates. You know, fraud's a very specific thing because you have to prove intent to do this. So it's a really a legal determination. So until all these cases are resolved, now there have been hundreds of people that have already pled guilty. There have been some that are convicted. There are hundreds of other investigations ongoing. We know there was a huge improper payments problem. Uh, it's just $78 billion just estimated in unemployment insurance alone uh, for 2021. That doesn't include all the special uh, programs that were created by the Congress. So in that some of the money's been recovered. Sometimes there's judgments against people and for restitution, but the odds of that being collected, you know, I mean, there's a kind of rule of thumb in the law enforcement community. It's about 10% of what uh, the restitution on. So the best thing to do is prevent it. Now, I, I made legislative recommendations again now to have more fraud reporting in the financial report of the federal government for Congress to reinstitute that requirement that, that lapsed uh, to provide more visibility. And I've recommended that Congress provide more aggressive oversight to make sure agencies can prevent fraud in the first place. That's our best safeguard right there. Yeah, prevent it before it happens. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, uh, thank right. you very much, Mr. Chairman. My time's up, so thank you. Thanks to the gentleman from uh, Washington, the distinguished gentlelady from Virginia, Ms. We Wexton. Chairman, appreciate it. Um, Mr. Jodaro, thank you for joining us here today. I really, I really like what you're saying. I mean, I don't like what you're saying. I just like that you're saying it. It's just very, very important. And GAO has done a lot to help save the government money. So I'm really curious about this issue of improper payments versus fraudulent payments. At what point are you able to determine whether they go from just being improper to being fraudulent? And is that something you have to refer to the DOJ in order for that determination to be made? Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, we, we at GAO, since we're in the legislative branch, we, we do not have law enforcement authority. So when we identify potential fraud, we refer it to the Justice Department uh, or to the inspector generals. You know, the inspector generals have much more, many more criminal investigators in GAO. And so that's why, you know, when we work with them, they do more of the fraud investigations. So we refer it to, to them as well. Got it, okay. And you are asking for about 100 more, uh, 100 more full-time employees for FY23, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And what area of expertise are those people gonna have? I mean, what, what do, you, do you need them because of these, of these new mandates that you have from the, from the infrastructure bill and from all the COVID relief and everything? Yeah, no, we have the talent really on board in those areas. The, the new people would be uh, mostly in the science and technology area. We're still hiring, we've hired a lot of engineers, people with, scientific backgrounds, microbiology, chemistry, aerospace engineering. So we want to continue to add to our science and technology area and more cybersecurity people in GAO. We'll hire some uh, people in defense uh, area. If we get the additional money and in infrastructure that we're asking, you know, I'd hire additional people, but they, they wouldn't necessarily, most of that work can be done by generalists at GAO who, you know, we have people that are experts in physical infrastructure that have been doing surface transportation, bridge work, telecommunications for a while. So we have capability to just be sizing that up a little bit more uh, to deal with this work because some of these mandates, you know, the, the coronavirus mandates, some of them go through 2025. Uh, the infrastructure, uh, some of those programs will go through uh, 2024 uh, as well. You know, we're, we're still auditing the TARP program from the uh, uh, Recovery Act days back in 2009, 2020, believe it or not. Uh, so these things have long tails on them, just like disaster. Aid. And uh, so, the, so we need more people to sustain this because if we don't, what happens is it eats up our capacity. So when new requests come in from Congress, we can't be as responsive. 
So if we don't get help on these special efforts, uh, it, it, it would make it much more difficult to reduce that four month response time I talked about earlier. Okay, so you think you're gonna need these people in perpetuity really? I mean, it's just not, it's not that that could be a temporary thing. Uh, that's yeah, yeah it's, it's, as much as perpetuity exists in life, uh, you know, I, yes, uh, it, we'll, we'll need that capacity for most part. But the money in infrastructure, I, you know, I put surface to financing the federal government's transportation infrastructure on our high risk list in 2007. You know, we still, I mean, despite this big investment, there are going to be continued needs. We don't have a, a, a way to fund the inf the, our transportation infrastructure on a regular basis the way we used to with the gas tax. I mean, the gas tax has been increased since uh, 1993. You know, the Congress has been tapping general appropriation funds since 2008 to supplement uh, the revenues that should be going into the trust fund. So the whole issue about user pay uh, has been broken there in the transportation area. So I do think there's going to be more attention to have to be focused on transportation issues beyond implementation of this new investment <laughs> uh, in that area. Proper versus fraudulent payments. Are, does GAO yeah. often often uncover them before the before like Medicaid does itself and before these agencies cover and cover it themselves? In in some cases we do. In some cases we do, but not in most cases. In most cases, I mean these are estimates that are made. Uh, and uh, I wanted, what I want to do, and I've tried to work with the administration, is in the Medicaid area, this is true in unemployment insurance as well, uh, they're administered at the state level. Now, each state has an auditor that's either appointed or elected, and, I, and we deal with those state auditors all the time. I think we ought to invest and give them more responsibilities to audit at the state level, because each of these programs, the Medicaid programs are different in each state, they're not uniform. And I think the state auditors, getting them involved could help prevent some of these things where they identified them, would identify them ahead of time. I'm also working with the administration, Treasury and OMB uh, and the White House um, uh, person focused on the American Rescue Act implementation on new ways to uh, do identity verification. So we know when somebody applies that that's the person who, 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 who says they are. You know, a lot of this fraud occurred with, uh, you know, people stealing identities, making up identities, face, fake firms. We should be able to do a better job in identifying and verifying who we're going to give the money to before we give it to them. Yeah, that, that's been a continuing issue. So if you, if, you, if you find any solutions, please let us know because it's something we've been looking for for many years. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, I used to have a greater faith in human nature before I took this job. But, uh, you know, these emergencies bring out the best in people, uh, you know, healthcare workers and others, and, but they bring out the worst uh, in people that want to prey on this situation. And, uh, and they do. And they're very creative. And so we need to be on our on our guard. Thank you very much, Mr. Dodaro. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back since it appears my time has long expired. Thank you, thank you Ms. Wexton. Uh, the distinguished gentleman from Hawaii, Mr. Case. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My, my faith in human nature has been on a long up and down curve since taking this job. <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank you again for all of your service. And I join everybody else's comments along those lines. Can I just stay on the subject of just understanding your, your staffing requests? Um, first of all, for, for um, FY 2022, recently enacted at 3,400 FTEs. Are you at 3,400 FTEs right now? No, we'll be close to that by the end of the year. Uh, we're like, our projections are, I think, around 3,390. So we're, we're very close. Okay. Um, and, then, and then I guess the, the similar question is, so you, you want to go up another 100. Uh, in response to Ms. Wexton, you outlined the areas where um, you want to go up. Um, I just did some really simple math just to understand what you were trying to achieve and, and um, kind of broke it down to a unit cost, if I can put it that way. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it looks like your, your unit cost per FTE request is is about 
up from F FY 2022 to 2023. All I did was just take the total amount requested, divide it by, you know, divided by the FTE and, and run a percentage from year to year uh, on it. Um, and I guess, um, I'm, first of all, does that sound about right, number one? And then number two, I'm just trying to ask myself, is that enough uh, to get you to uh, 3,500 um, FTEs at, 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 a, at an increase of somewhere around 5%? I guess it would make sense if, I guess it would depend a lot on where those FTEs were. But if you're trying to hire into the far more competitive I think you went on on mute, uh, uh, Connors. I don't know where I went off. Um, well, I, you 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 did, we weren't off long. Okay, uh, so if you're try, if you're trying to hire, <clears throat> I was saying that if <clears throat> if you're that would depend a lot on on where your FTEs were coming from. Maybe five percent would be uh, reasonable in in some areas of FTE increase. But if you're in a highly competitive environment, as I suspect you still are. Uh, from a from a salary perspective, are you mm -hmm. is that going to be enough to get you to three thousand five hundred FTEs or at least the ones that you want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we can get there. Uh, we've been we've been fairly aggressive in hiring this year, even though the our appropriation wasn't known until halfway through the fiscal year. You know that that's a problem. Uh, I mean, when I testified before the House Modernization Committee, they wanted to know what, what they could do to help us. So they said, well, if we can get our appropriation passed before the beginning of the fiscal year, that'd be a good start because you don't want to hire. Now, we were able to be more aggressive this year since we did get additional supplemental appropriations for the CARES Act funding. And so we felt confident moving forward in that area. Uh, so we're going to end this year you know, a lot depends on how your your strength at the end of the year when and how many people you have. Because if you don't have a lot of people on board at the beginning of the fiscal year, it's hard to burn the FTE level during the year. So I feel confident we'll be able to do that and we'll be able to find the people that we need. Uh, we've been pretty successful in the science and technology area, uh, cybersecurity as well. I've been very pleased. Uh, with our ability to recruit in those areas. The other areas, uh, healthcare and defense, won't, won't be a problem uh, at all. We've got a long track record there and we've done pretty good. I mentioned earlier that we hired 440 some interns since the COVID started. What we do is we hire our interns competitively. And so once we know how much money we could do, we can make those that did a good job, a job offer right away and get them all scheduled to come in on that time. So I, 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 I'm fairly confident we can hit the FTE level. Of course, it would help if, if we get our 23 appropriation, uh, you know, at least by the end of the first quarter in, in 2023. Oh, I'm glad you said 2023. I was going to ask you which first quarter were you referring to? <laughs> um, and just, just a quick clarification, the, the, um, <clears throat> Let's see, the, the amounts that were allocated straight from the bipartisan infrastructure plan where you picked up obligations there, are, are those positions necessary to carry those out? Are those part of your 3,500 FTEs or are those, are those kind of a separate category of staff? Those are a separate category of staff. That, okay. that was over the, we're asking for for multiple years. And over those years, it, it would be equivalent of 125 staff, but spread over a number of years. Okay, great. All right. Uh, thank you so much again. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Case. The distinguished gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Amade. Going once. Going twice. There he is. Chairman, can you hear me? There you are. Hey, sorry about that. Uh, sorry, Mr. Comptroller General. Listen, we've, we've reviewed your report, been listening with uh, your conversations with the other folks. I want to thank you for your service and we'll yield back. Thank you. Yep. Thank Good you. to see you again. Uh, distinguished gentleman from New York, Mr. Espayat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Controller Todaro. 
Last year, the, the GAO science and technology team grew uh, tremendously, uh, reaching a total of 123 staff members as of December of 2021. What is your staff goal for the SST team in order to bolster your expertise in science and technology? And how will your fiscal year 23, uh, 23 proposal help you achieve this goal? That's the first question. Sure. Uh, uh, we're hopeful that we can achieve about 140 staff by the end of this fiscal year. Although well, that's a little bit of a stretch goal, but I'm hopeful then that we can increase it to about 165 people or so, depending upon the response to our budget request in fiscal 2023, Congressman. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Controller. Now, um, my second question is, as part of the GAO's COVID-19 monitoring and oversight responsibilities under the CARES Act, the GAO found that some Eng English uh, language learners couldn't fully participate in distance learning due to language barriers and limited access to technology. Your report states that English language learners lost the opportunities to pr practice their language skills. According to school district officials and representatives of a professional association, this is a reality that I have heard from my constituency. Additionally, families have informed me that their children are being misclassified as having learning disabilities instead of uh, having English language learners uh, challenges. Does the services they receive that are often misguided and delaying their academic success? Uh, um, will you commit to studying how, how local uh, education agencies determine how students are uh, classified as English language learners in order to guarantee that the funds to these populations are used in a manner that's what we intended as members of Congress? Yeah, yes, I'm, I'm uh, you know, happy to look further at that issue. You know, as a parent, grandparent myself, I'm very concerned about the learning loss that occurred during the pandemic. You know, we found of a national survey that over 1 million teachers had at least one student who never showed up uh, at all, uh, you know, during the, the, the pandemic. And so uh, this is a problem. It's a problem, especially for those that have language, uh, you know, challenges associated with them, but also special needs children as well. Uh, you know, regardless of the language. And so this is a very important issue. It's a, it's a sad development uh, for our, our children and uh, hopefully we can recover, but I'd be happy to look further at that issue. Now, very often English language learners are expected to be proficient, English proficient in like a very short period of time. Most data shows that it takes anywhere from six to seven years to be language proficient. Uh, and some of the metrics of the tests that are provided by states uh, are tough even for uh, US born uh, children mm -hmm. uh, with regards to English language arts. And so uh, and, and a language learner, an English language learner may be asked within a year to be performing at a level that even US born children have difficulties meeting. And so as a result, they often get misclassified uh, with a, uh, as having a disability or they're forced into failure. And they, you know, they're sort of like pushed into a corner where they will fail. So I think it's important that we adapt to their needs and be able to recognize what their needs are, whether they're English language learner or children with special needs, mm -hmm. and then provide the tools that they will be able to use to move forward. But I do hope, uh, thank you, uh, and I do hope that my team will be working with you on eliminating these barriers for academic achievement for English language learners. Uh, I yield back, Mr. Chair. I thank the gentleman. Thank you, uh, gentlemen from New York. We appreciate it. Um, we covered a lot of ground here uh, today. Mr. Dodaro, thank you so much for your time. Um, we've got a, a lot of different hearings going on now that, that our members need to get to. 
uh, as you know, happens this time of year. So we're only going to do one round of questions. We appreciate your thoroughness. And again, on a, on a personal level, I think all the members of the committee, uh, we, we uh, lean on you and we count on you and we count on, uh, on the work of all the good people that you have with you. So if you could just make sure you let them know how invaluable they are to us trying to make this, this thing called government work and trying our best to modernize uh, to keep up with all of the challenges that we all face. Please let them know how much we appreciate them and we appreciate you. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely be in touch and we're gonna look very, very closely at, at uh, your budget request, knowing the demands that you all have and then also considering the demands we have here with the limited amount of resources. So we appreciate you, we love you and uh, can't thank you enough. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman.